Now, how's your boyfriend? <laughs> right, I'm going. <laughs> Come on. That woke you up, didn't it? So, what do you love most about duck? The dipping sauce. The dipping sauce. I love that. Uh, let's get the duck in the oven first. Just a little bit of salt in there, please. Then some pepper. Thank you. Some spring onion, garlic and ginger. Now, why do you think we put that in there? To season it and flavour it. Mm -hmm. How come do you put them in whole like that and not smaller? It's going inside. I'm not using it for sauce or anything, so it's just going to make it really nice. What are they? Star anise. Star anise. Put that in. So what happens as the duck roasts on the outside, it creates this really nice perfume, aroma inside. Tuck that in there. To get it spicy, rub all that Chinese fine spice yep. over. Almost like you're massaging. Good. So make sure you get it all in. Even the little wings, you know, underneath there. Just like I used to do to you in the bath. <laughs> I used to wash your little handies. <laughs> I know, those days are long gone. I know, I know, I know, it's your dad. Right. Long gone. That is seriously spicy. With the duck, there's generally quite a lot of fat there. Yeah. So we're going to put it on this little bench, OK? And that goes there. By slowly roasting it, Mm -hmm. Okay, it's going to get nice and crisp on the outside. All that fat is going to render inside the breast, so therefore it's going to get all nice and juicy. Yeah. Right, duck's in. Three and a half hours at 160 degrees Celsius. Your favourite part, you said, was the... Dipping sauce. Why is it your favourite part? I think it really adds to the duck and mm. makes it really tasty. Seeing as it's your favourite, now you can make it. I'm going to do nothing, OK? Daddy's going to put his feet up. So, Thank you. Uh, first off, the garlic. There's one. Here we go. Watch your fingers, please. Always do. Good. Nice. Oh, you're fast. Huh? Watch your fingers. I am. <laughs> Watch your fingers. <laughs> slow, slow down. Please. I'm 14. All right, that's enough. Mm. Right, a little teaspoon of olive oil. In a few years' time, we'll be teaching you how to drive as well as cook. How uh -oh. exciting is that, you and I in a car? <laughs> Scary thought. <laughs> OK, yeah. garlic in. Crispy duck is traditionally served with hoisin sauce, but my brood love the additional big, bold punch of black beans. Nice. Megan and I add soy sauce. And lastly, for that classic Chinese sweet and sour element, brown rice vinegar and honey. Uh, you happy with the flavour? I'm really happy. Mm -hmm. You can taste everything in there. Mm. Dipping sauce done. Duck's in the oven. Let's start the dessert. The most amazing tartar tan. Are those pink peppercorns? They are pink peppercorns. Mm, they're really good. Aren't they don't they? taste anything no. like black peppercorns. Quite sweet, aren't they? They're really sweet, very yeah. fruity. The pink peppercorns give it the sweetness. The black peppercorns give the heat. Now, what is that, baby? Vanilla. This is one of the easiest desserts in the world to make, but one of the most delicious. It's a sort of take on the classic apple or pear to tan. But when you caramelise those bananas with the peppercorns and the vanilla... I bet that tastes amazing. Oh, my goodness. Incredible. OK, I'm going to make the caramel. Start off with the cold pan first. And you just press that butter in there. How come do you do it like that and not let it just melt naturally? Mm -hmm. Because I want the butter to stay cold, because I'm going to stick the bananas in there. OK. And then we'll make the caramel and caramelise the bananas at the same time. OK. So in goes those... Vanilla. Vanilla seeds. Pods in there as well. OK, peppercorns done? Yeah, they're all done. Good girl. Sprinkle them over, that butter. Just naturally. Naturally, yeah. Nice. And then, look, just very carefully, sprinkle sugar over that. You're doing them all the same size. Roughly the same size. Wedge it into the butter. Well, do you know what? I want the bananas really caramelised. You just stop them between. If you cram them in like this, OK, it will stop them moving around. Nothing's moving. Nothing is. OK, so yeah. all wedged in there. Sprinkle the peppercorns on top of the bananas so you've got that flavour in the caramel and on the top and the bottom. Right. Puff pastry. Puff pastry is difficult and time-consuming to make, so I always buy ready-made when I'm at home. To get the best flavour and texture, go for the all-butter type and keep your pastry cold before using it. 
And this is where it gets really exciting. You get your fingers and you just pinch the end, so you thin the end. If you can do that for me yeah. very carefully, you have to be quick, because the heat of your fingers can melt the pastry. How comes you do it, Dad? Because we get it nice and thin, so we can clip it underneath. Now, we take a spoon, and what we do is lift up that banana and tuck it underneath. See, lift up like the banana. Like a parcel. Like a parcel. And see the thin bits of pastry? Yeah. How easy it is to get it underneath. Yeah. And that's why you thin them out. Lift you do it up. so quickly. Well, because I have to be quick, otherwise the pastry will melt. Notice how we're not using anything sharp, so we're not... Just would that cut the pastry if you... That's right. See how locked down that is? Mm-hmm. Gas on. We're going to start caramelising that. Those three little holes are so important. Mm -hmm. If we didn't put a hole in the pastry... and uh, It will cause a lot of steam, so the pastry never cooks, it just goes really soggy. OK. So, really important. The caramel's live now. We're working the caramel. Give it a little shake. How can you see the caramel through the pastry? And look what happens when it tilts. Oh, yeah. See? It all comes running down. See? Yeah, I see. Now, that pastry, OK, is, like, clinging on to the bananas. And so when we turn it upside down, we've got this glove full of these caramelised bananas. Look at that. Wow. It looks a locky. Look a locky? <laughs> <laughs> look a locky? Ah, look a likey. Got you now, baby. You're so annoyed. <laughs> I'm so annoyed. <laughs> uh, it's your birthday soon. 15. I've just worked it out. On my 50th, you're 18. Perfect. We should do a joint party. Yeah, love it. 12 to 4 for the old ones. 12 lunchtime. Lunchtime till 4 for the old mm. ones so they can go to sleep. Me Megan, And then please. we'll go on later. Come on. Perfect. This is where I get excited now. Look at the colour of that caramel. So, tilt the pan again. See how dark it is now? Yeah. Wow, it's gone a lot darker now. Didn't mm -hmm. take long. Didn't take long at all. That's nearly ready for the oven. Mm -hmm. But before I put that in, I'll get the duck out. Wow. How's the duck doing? Crispy. Wow. And delicious. See how crispy that is? It's really crispy. That's what happens when it slow cooks. So, 20 minutes for the duck to rest and 20 minutes in the oven at 190 to 200 degrees for our banana tartar tan. Time to knock up a quick hoisin and cucumber salad to put in our crispy duck pancakes. For the dressing, combined hoisin sauce, rice wine vinegar, soy sauce, a dash of sesame oil, and to give it that zingy Asian punch, some freshly grated root ginger. For the salad, trim and cut spring onions into very fine matchsticks. Peel a whole cucumber into long, thin ribbons. And shred in a couple of baby gem lettuces. Season and toss this fresh, crunchy salad in the sweet, yummy hoisin dressing. A combination that never fails to get the kids eating their greens. Wow. Look at that. So, see now where that pastry is caramelising. Caramel, so dark. And just a little tip. Gas back on, and that will release it. Because if you tip it and it's still sticking, mm -hmm. then some of your bananas will stick. Oh. Yeah. So now, See when it starts spinning yeah, around you can like see that? It's moving around. It's a lot. moving around. And here we are, the moment of truth. When you know your daddy is the best chef in the world. Hmm. Ready? Yeah. Wow. Boom. Look at the vanilla. How delicious it looks is that? Amazing. It smells Isn't it? really good as well. Right, tart the out. Duck, crispy. Dipping sauce. Mm-hmm. Cucumber salad, ready? Mm -hmm. So if you take them and your dipping sauce... Take them over. Thank you. I'll take the duck. Don't drop it. Promise. Oh. OK. Yeah. It's amazing. My ultimate big and bold dinner of crispy roast duck with pancakes with a hoisin dressed salad and some extra oomph from Megan's favourite black bean dipping sauce. Caramelised figs with ricotta. Slow cooking can also take desserts to a whole new level. A gentle, long cook can really bring out that wonderful, rich, sticky sweetness and that depth of flavour in fruits.
These are black figs. They are suited to slow cooking, roasting, better than the green figs, because this outside skin is so durable. This is an amazing way of roasting figs, and it's so easy, yet so delicious. Lay your figs out in rows. Take some rosemary and just peel that down. Get that really nice fragrant stem. Get your scissors, trim the edge. Almost where you've got a bit of a sort of sharp point. Bring your three figs together and just thread the top of each fig nice and gently. Rosemary works wonderfully with sweet dishes. As the figs roast in the oven, the stalk will impart a lovely, subtle flavour. Beautiful. Dust the figs with ice and sugar, then coat them with a generous splash of balsamic vinegar. Leave them to sit there for five minutes, and they sort of marinate. I know it sounds odd to use vinegar in your dessert, but trust me, it gives the dish a fantastic sweet and sour taste. I'm going to make a really nice caramel. Four or five tablespoons of sugar. Now, flatten that out and get it nice and even. When the sugar is even, caramel cooks evenly. It's changing now. You can see it melting from the outside in. The one thing you don't do is shake the pan rapidly. You can see it almost like sort of a lake defrosting and it's hitting to the centre. Bubbling, it's still not dark enough yet. It's getting there. Turn the gas down and stay in control. Let the sugar melt until it turns a dark amber colour. The secret behind any good caramel is just stopping it from overcooking. Lovely. Take that off the gas. Knob of butter in there. Just gently whisk in the butter. It's cooling the caramel down. You'll see it changing colour to like a cafe au lait. Next, add a glug of the balsamic vinegar. Nice. Beautiful. Got that nice, dark richness of the caramel. A little touch of water in there. That way the caramel doesn't go too thick. Now put the caramel back on the heat. Take your figs and sort of place them in gently. Lovely. And then just add all that lovely little marinade. Mmm, don't waste that. That's amazing stuff there. No. Ice and sugar and balsamic vinegar. There's something so tasty. Baste those figs. Because the skin gets nice and crispy on the outside. And the fig sort of just absorbs the caramel. It's delicious. It's so easy. Now. Into the oven, 190 for 10 minutes. Almost doubled in size. Now look at the colour on them. The smell is incredible onto your plate. They're a lot heavier because they've actually started absorbing that caramel. Now douse the figs with caramel and serve with ricotta cheese. The freshness of that ricotta goes brilliantly well with the figs. I'm going to finish that now with some zest and then some little nibbed almonds and the rich, creamy jam texture of the fig with the ricotta goes brilliant. That is an amazing way of slow roasting fruit and taking figs to a completely new level. Pan on for the stuffing. It's a saddle of lamb, basically a sort of Rolls Royce cut, perfectly shaped, and it suits stuffing to an absolute T. For the stuffing, finely chop an onion. Garlic, nice thin slices. Oil in. Onions and garlic in. Just salt and pepper. Make sure the stuffing is beautifully seasoned so it helps to season the inside of the lamb. Now we've got the colour on those onions. We're going to throw in some pine nuts. And that helps to give a bit of a texture. Here's where it starts getting really exciting. Spinach in. 
and just lay the spinach over the pine nuts. It looks like a lot of spinach, but that's going to condense and disappear almost instantly. There's so much more flavour in spinach when you sauté it, as opposed to steaming it or boiling it. Gas off, and look at that. Now, to bring that together, no eggs, no breadcrumbs, crumpled feta over the spinach. Feta cheese adds a beautifully salty, sharp and creamy flavour. What this does, it brings that stuffing together. Now, open up the lamb. Keep those little fillets to the side. That's the channel that we want to stuff. So I want to just open that up a little bit there. Salt and pepper, lightly. And before we put our stuffing in, we're going to season it with sumac. Sumac is a wonderful lemony spice that goes brilliantly with lamb, and you can get it in most big supermarkets. And it sort of cuts through that thick, rich sweetness of the lamb. Open up that lamb there. Take a spoon. If you're preparing this for the day ahead, then let the stuffing cool down. It's inevitable when you start rolling it and tying it, something's going to squeeze out. So load up the ends. Take these beauties, these little fillets, and just support that stuffing and sort of increase that beautiful tunnel. And then from there, over, there, and bring that towards you, and then roll. Like I said, some of the stuff is going to come out. Now, to tie it, first off, around the side. And don't worry about some flash butcher's knot. Just tie it. One in the middle. You can get butcher's string from your local butcher or at cookware shops. They go too tight. Go too tight, it just forces all that stuffing out of the lamb when it's in the oven. Nice. Now, we just season the top of it. Roll the joint to make sure all the skin gets seasoned. Now, you think normally that just goes in the oven like that. That's how my mum would do it, but get your tray onto the gas. Oil in. Get it really nicely coloured. None of your stuffing's coming out of the sides, really important. Look at that colour, beautiful. It does kickstart the roasting process. Gas off, into the oven. Cook for 45 to 55 minutes, depending on how pink you want your lamb. Lift the lamb out of the fat to rest. Resting it raised up in the tin will stop it cooking, but not cool it down too quickly, and means you won't lose any of those lovely juices. Next, I'm making a simple but sophisticated accompaniment for the lamb. Top and tail the cucumber. Peel it. Cut the cucumber into three. And just core. Taking out all that, it's just sort of watery, seedy, and it spoils the flavour. Slice the cucumber. Cucumber in. Really nice way of making a cheap and cheerful cucumber look glamorous. We're going to dress that cucumber with a nice, fresh yoghurt. A couple of tablespoons. Next, some fresh mint. Dress it. Touch of salt. Touch of pepper. And then pomegranate molasses. That just sweetens it up. Finish that with lemon. Mix that up. Lamb is rested. Carefully take off the string and then just gently Pull them back. Straight edge knife that's going to cut through that crispy fat on the outside instantly. I tied it purposely so I can get my portion control from the lines. Hold it nice and firmly. Look at your line where the string was and look. And this one is going to be amazing. Lay and down. Just in those two slices there, it proves that stuffing meats is for special occasions because that is a saddle of lamb at its absolute best. Stuffing meats and fish not only makes them look fantastic, it also gives them an extra added flavour dimension too. Once you've mastered the technique, you'll be able to turn out dishes that will guarantee you'll have an unforgettable feast. So if you unwrap the chocolate, start breaking up in little bits, we're going to make the most amazing white chocolate mousse. Our first job is to bring half of our cream up to the boil. So what kind of cream is that in there, Dad? That is double cream, OK? So that's going to make a really nice, rich chocolate mousse. What's your favourite sort of chocolate? Is it white, milk, dark? Um, I love white and milk. 
What's yours? I absolutely love milk chocolate. Oh, that's my guilty pleasure. Is it really? Here we go. Cream in. So that goes in there. Now, you can see what's happening straight away, can't you? It's melting really quickly. It's melting really quickly. So, OK. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Alicia, your jumper's white, so you won't spot it. Yeah, and I've got a nice little snack for later. <laughs> In another bowl, add lime zest, cold cream, and whisk until it forms soft peaks. The lime cuts the sort of richness of the cream, and that starts to make the chocolate mousse taste a little bit lighter. Mmm, it smells really good. The lime gives it a really nice zinginess. Zinginess, you're absolutely right. Next, add to the melted chocolate mixture. And because I'm whisking, it's just getting lighter and lighter okay. and lighter. Have a little taste. Mmm. Nice? Yeah, the lime gives it a really nice taste. Tilly, I need the rest for the mousse. I need some for my tummy. No, come on. Chocolate mousse into the fridge. Our next job is to separate out three egg whites. This is where I need you at your absolute best, OK? Because to whip those whites is going to be really tough. So we'll take it in turns, 30 seconds each, OK? You go first. 10 seconds gone. Come on, Tilly. 15 seconds gone. 20 seconds gone. Come on, you can do it. 10 seconds to go. Five, four, three, two, one. And change. Excellent. Hold the bowl. Right. No. No way! Cheetah! Oh, oh, what? <laughs> Come on. That, it's over, Dad. <laughs> Matilda! That's you can't it. walk out and do it. You can't do that to me! <laughs> 30 seconds, this puny little thing, and you come with this big little machine gun. Because <laughs> that's the best way of whipping up egg whites. But why didn't I do it that way? <laughs> you start tipping that sugar in slowly. Good girl. Still not very happy, you know. So. <laughs> Our contentious whipped egg whites will make our mousse light and airy. And when they've reached soft peaks, we can gently mix in our cooled white chocolate and cream mixture. Once the egg whites hit the cream, yep. the chocolate sets, the egg whites keep the cream nice and fluffy, and you get this nice light mousse in the bowl. Now, I need you to crush some raspberries, please, with some fresh mint. You can Great. see all the juices coming out. Now, take your mousse. Wow, that looks really cool. Now, look at that down the bottom there, look. Crushed raspberry. Delicious. And the mint. Now, I'm going to set that in the fridge. If you could be so kind, open the door, please. Our yummy white chocolate mousse will take at least two hours to set, so we can crack on with our Mediterranean-inspired vegetarian starter. Griddle courgette, ricotta and mint bruschetta. For this recipe, you'll need a griddle pan, an essential piece of kit for that char grill look. Cut thick slices of chapata bread. Drizzle both sides with olive oil. Season with a little salt and pepper. And griddle each side until toasted. Then slice a couple of courgettes diagonally into half a centimetre thick pieces. Drizzle and coat in olive oil and season with salt and pepper. Sear on a smoking hot griddle pan in batches until all the courgettes are bar marked on both sides. Next, roughly chop mint leaves and combine with creamy ricotta cheese. Spread your toasted chapata with dollops of minty ricotta and top with your seared courgette. Super simple and super tasty. Now we're going to make a delicious beetroot risotto. We need to get the shallots, just slice them in half and then just chop them like that. OK? OK. Now, have you ever made a risotto? I haven't, actually. Shots, please, into the pan for Daddy. Add a sprinkle of salt and pepper, along with a couple of crushed cloves of garlic. Once you start cooking the risotto, it's really important to have your stock gently boiling away. If we're adding cold stock on top of the rice all the time, it just slows down the process. Generally, you cook it a nice, wide, flat pan. Yeah. If you cook it in a deep pan, all the rice sort of cooks at different temperatures. What stock is that in there, Dad? Because that's a vegetable stock. Yeah, because okay. you can't have different stocks if it's for a vegetarian, can you? No, you can't have chicken stock. I made that mistake once, putting beef stock in a vegetarian soup. 
Did you? No, I Thank didn't. You. Matilda. Are you sure? I'm positive. I'm joking. Fry off the time. How nice does that smell? It smells delicious. Rice in? That's a bit of a different rice. And this is Elborio rice. It's a perfect rice for risotto. Now, it's really important to sear the rice. If we were just to put the stock in without sweating off the rice, it goes all starchy. So keep on stirring for Daddy. Is this going to make a flambe? No flambe on the risotto. To go with our deep red beetroot theme, I'm adding red wine, followed by the first ladle of stock to get things started. Now we're off. Wow, it's giving it a cloudy sort of look. What's happening to the stock? The stock is reducing down and the rice is sucking it in. That's right. So the rice is actually getting nice and plump. When a risotto is live, when it's like this now, we can't stop cooking it. We have to cook it all the way. OK, ready for the next ladle? I'm ready. Good girl. Here we go. Ladle in. So we have to make this for literally 20, 25 minutes. And we're nursing it all the way. Beetroots. Peel them. Rub them with a little bit of salt and sugar. Yeah. And a little bit of aged balsamic vinegar in there. Roasted them. And we're great. My parmesan. How's that rice doing? The rice is doing good. Now, that is exactly where you want to be now, look. Look at that nice, glossy, textured rice. So, beetroot. I want you to put two-thirds of the beetroot in there for me, saving one-third for the top. Good. Sprinkle the parmesan in there for me, please, all over. Nice. It's like it's snowing. Again. And then we're just going to get some nice butter in there. The butter gives the risotto a really nice gloss. Look at that. Beautiful. Let that come down. Let it come down first. All right, get your spoon in there now for Daddy. Beautifully, there you go. Good. Wonderful. Shake it. The risotto should be like lava. It just flows out. And then the rest of the beetroot on top. And then we finish. And then some extra virgin olive oil. I'll pick up the bruschetta. You take that to the table. OK? Let's go, Danny. Mm. This is my ultimate vegetarian dinner. Delicious courgette ricotta and mint top bruschetta. An unctuous roasted beetroot and thyme risotto. And for put, an indulgent white chocolate and lime mousse with fresh crushed raspberries.